Evolution of IR. International relations is an ever-changing field of study which has had the utmost importance not only throughout history but also in shaping current political, economic and social systems. As a matter of fact, interrelations between groups based on kinship and later on between uh, political entities has been a constant almost as old as humanity itself. Precisely this set of relations set the precedent for our perception of the world and our place in it. To trace back the establishment of international relations, we will seek to understand the several processes and systemic changes throughout which it has evolved. In addition, we will also reflect upon the divergence of branches within IR, the ancient practice of international relations, and the recent emergence of the academic discipline with the same name. In order to firstly analyze and try to discern the origin of our field of interest, we ought to start grasping the processes in when, where, and how IR has been practiced. To start comprehending the international relations, the first actor that must be revised and studied are the hunter-gatherers. The hunter-gatherers are part of the so-called first wave, the first step in this long chain of processes that are part of the construction of the international relations system that we know nowadays. The first wave emerged 4,000 years ago approximately, when we started witnessing the first recruitment of hunters to create nomad groups in its beginning between 15 and 75 people. With knowledge of the territory, they engaged with each other in a form of exchange that resulted in a long-distance movement of good and ideas. Hunter-gatherers supposed the end of small isolated units of human beings into organized groups that improved their survival and life conditions. As there were not isolated units, this exchange was frequent and easier to do today share a common language. However, it must be reminded that this first process is not an international system, rather the first brick in order to achieve these long processes to develop the practical IR that we defend. Another important factor is that they were an egalitarian society, which means that no one was the leader or the head of the group. They were together as one and had the same prevalence. Hunter-gatherers also represent the first relationship between human beings based on kinship, as they group depending on their tribes or bands. This new factor is a key point to understand this cooperation between hunter-gatherers. Their innovative social structure still has its relevance in the evolution of cooperation and cultural capacity of the current times and supposed the first step towards it, the creation of more complex social units that will end up forming independent systems. Around 3000 BCE, we find the ancient civilization that would later come to be known as Summer. Comprised of 12 city-states, Sumer is one of the earliest representations of the first use of practical IR. Each city-state that made up Sumer differentiated itself from seden sedentary tribes with the emergence of established territories clearly marked where uh, the city-state started and ended. Apart from, from this, an apart from this, another important characteristic that separates city-states from sedentary hunter-gatherer tribes is the transfer of the basis of social structures from kinship towards institutions. These institutions weren't only the hallmark of the social structure inside each city-state individually, as there, were, as there were some overarching institutions that englobed all 12 uh, Sumerian city-states. In a hymn from King Shulgi of the Sumerian city-state of Ur, and, and in other later mytholog uh, mythological texts, we can find proof of assemblies taking place where the fate of the, whole, uh, of the whole of summer was decided by the respective leaders of the biggest and most influential uh, city-states, Nippur, Uruk, Ur, etc. And although through these texts, King Shulgi of, of Ur does, does seek to centralize power, one of the main, uh, main important aspects to consider and take into account is the fact that these uh, texts convey the notion that he tries to persuade the other leaders of the city-states. He does not order them. Thus, demonstrating that he does not hold sovereign power uh, over, over them, nor do they of him. Demonstrating how this is to be held as one of the first practice of, uh, practices of international politicking. Now fast forward, give or take a thousand or a thousand five hundred years, and we start to see how these city-states whom share the same language and for the most part the same culture grow and unite together forming different empires. And here is where the practice of international relations takes another huge step, as, uh, as it is here where the Amarna system, as it will later be called, enabled relations between five different empires of the time situated in closely the same area, Babylon, Hatti, Egypt, Mitanni, and Assyria, uh, for close to almost two centuries. In letters sent to and from the different kings and pharaohs from the five different empires, the kings treat each other with a distinct manner of respect, highlighted e uh, highlight each other as equals and not as inferior. Uh, sometimes even referring to one another as brother, even though some em empires had much more abundance of certain goods, such as gold, than others. The Amarna letters were used for various reasons, spanning from trade to courtship of one of the king's daughters to another king. All these letters were written in Akkadian and were all, always fairly respectful of each empire's customs and religious traditions. So much, so much so that they would be reluctant to sometimes critique another king on the treatment of their subordinates if it were to impose a dilemma between the two cultures. 
The Martin Letters represent a major stepping stone towards the modern international system. They constitute an international arena where we see the makings of a genuine system of states. Ancient Greece. The Delic League was a military alliance between Greek city-states, promoted by Athens to fight the Persians. Each of the cities contributed soldiers and chiefs and an economic amount. In theory, the Delic's treasury was administrated by the Federal Council, which also decided the Delic League policy, declarations of war, and peace treaties, by Council of the Member States. In order to intervene between the various parties and resolve conflict between them, the figure of the proxenes was established to restore trust and thereby to prevent conflict and ensure peace. However, the weight of Athens, whose decisions prevail over the members, gradually increased until it became hegemonic. In the end, Athens ended up instrumentalizing the League for its imperialist purposes, appropriating the treasury of the League to use it for its own interest. This is a clear example of how the development of international relations not only becomes more complex, consolidations of the diplomatic corps, internal regulations and control of the compliance with agreements, but also loses its egalitarian character owing to the strength and power of one of its members. The Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta marked the end of the Delos League. From the point of view of international relations as a theoretical corpus and effective organizations through a diplomatic corps, a very important leap forward was made in history. Despite being a military alliance, the need for independent political entities such as the Greek city-states became evident. They agreed to collaborate against the common threat of the Persian Empire and implemented a series of regulatory and control of mechanisms to ensure compliance with agreements through the figure of, Pro of the Proxenos. Complex political unit to take into account is the Mongol Empire. The Mongol Empire of the 13th and 14th century has been the largest land empire in history. Originated in East Asia, the Mongols, contrary to the Roman Empire, were a nomadic empire that emerged from the unification of different nomadic tribes under the leadership of Genghis Khan. Under his rule, they managed to expand and grew rapidly by sending invading raids in every direction. This military and diplomatic interaction supposed the key point to create a network between different social groups in, Eur in Eurasia that helped to create the idea of international trade and cooperation. The Silk Road is a clear example of this and played a key role in all these exchanges as, as it was a linear, a linear international system controlled by the Mongol Empire. The vast empire connected the east with the west, the Pacific with the Mediterranean. The Mongol Empire allowed all kinds of cultures and religions with the condition that they should recognize the sovereignty of the Khan. particular timeline, we found the Peace of Westphalia. The Peace of Westphalia represents the beginning of the modern era, leaving behind the political organization characteristic of the feudal area. The Peace of Westphalia consists of several treaties that brought to an end conflicts with religion roots such as the Thirty Years' War and those based on dynastic principles such as the Eighty Years' War. In this case, the independence of the United Provinces of the Netherlands in dispute with the House of Habsburg dynasty implied the recognition of the states as sovereign entities and consolidated the principle of non-interference in the internal affairs. At the same time, the Peace of Westphalia brought about changes in the foundation of international law that resulted in the establishment of a new European balance. The new order emerged from the disintegration of the Holy Roman Empire linked to the defense of the Catholic religion and the authority of the Pope. At the end, the dispute with the Protestant reform that had led them to the wars of religion. For the first time in history, the state is the raison d'etre of international relations, leaving aside other considerations such as the denominational national principles and dynastic rights, which meant the modern states were able to interact with each other on the basis of the respect for their sovereignties. Since the Treaty of Westphalia, the modern state with a centralized administration, a growing homogenization of laws and an efficient system for obtaining resources was consolidated. Following the Peace of Westphalia, Europe expanded outside the old continent. Colonial expansion will entail a change of perspective in international relations, as it will become increasingly urgent to regulate the relations of the colonies with their respective metro metropolis and, the, and of the emerging powers with respect to their former empires such as Spain and Portugal. Has survived and evolved the greatest of the difficulties and the harshest systemic alterations. Ancient rulers recognized the importance of diplomats who carried their words and worked for their leader as critical for their polity's stability, endurance, and growth. Nonetheless, it is precisely in the attachment of IR as just a mere extension of politics where we ought to assert the second statement of this project. As proven by the processes recently explained, diplomacy has constantly worked with the aim through which achieve national prosperity and stability, but constantly regarded as a political tool. Nonetheless, international relations constitute much more. 
In the 18th and 19th centuries, intellectuals and philosophers such as Locke, Kant or Rousseau start conceiving what would be the foundation of academic discipline of IR. In their works, they start to convey a perspective of diplomacy not only linked to the end of achieving a political goal, but also as a means for understanding social patterns, political decisions and economic and legal swift, which we wrapped all together in premature theories such as liberalism or realism and would encompass all these features intersectionally. Furthermore, other academics such as Karl Marx started to dynamize the field by broadening the comprehension of IR not only as a practice to be carried out, but rather as a field of study to be subsequently analyzed. The 20th century brought with it two harsh world wars, which would severely shape the world. The complexity of them started an extensive wave of research, which would end up conforming the academic field of IR. The establishment of IR, neither the practical branch nor the academic discipline, cannot be summarized in a single event, and not even probably in a single century, but rather must be regarded as a very complex chain of processes, which consequently set the basis of knowledge for the next one to took over over time. The establishment of international systems in ancient Sumerian city-states marked a starting point, but certainly cannot be considered to be the definitive establishment. Huge amount of change that has been experienced since then, which has heavily shaped the practices, although it is certain that some of them are still present and ongoing. That said, it is rather obvious that we ought not to consider practical IR to be started in Westphalia as much as we cannot consider the academic discipline to have started with the confirmation of international relations theories, or even the creation of the UN, although all these events supposed an incredible change of paradigm for both the practice and the study of IR. In addition, it is also important for us to highlight the divergence between the two branches of IR, acknowledging the respective aims and the differences between the two of them, as they also differ in their foundation processes. Finally, we ought to finish this project by also stating that in international relations, the only constant is change. And the numerous challenges time will pose on us would only be understood and solved if we comprehend and intertwine the previous amount of work that has brought us to where we are today. Thank you very much.